I think we're longer. I see great conversations going on, but we will have more time during the day for schmoozing. But we won't have time for lunch unless we get things started soon. And having lunch is a high priority with me. So uh, our next panel is going to talk about some of the legal and regulatory issues. Our first two speakers will talk about patent issues. And our third speaker uh, from the FDA will talk about FDA-related issues. Again, their bios are in your materials. Mildred Cho, Adam Breyer, and Alberto Gutierrez. Mildred is first. Thanks, Hank, and thanks for inviting me. Let's see if I can um, operate this. OK, that's up there. Um, OK, thanks. So in the next about 10 minutes, I'm just going to address one question very, very um, incompletely. But the basic um, issue that I'm interested in is whether policies that we have that are supposed to and are designed to incent um, innovation and um, encourage commercialization of technologies um, is actually doing that in, um, in the area of genetic testing. And just the short answer to that, um, I will say, is no. And the other question that I want to um, say something about is whether I think the answer, that no answer, is specific to genetic diagnostic tests. And I think the answer to that is yes. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about why and give you some examples from um, the prenatal testing and genetic testing world. If I can get this slide to move forward. There we go. I think that's right. OK. So as you've already um, gotten a sense um, from the other previous talks today, the landscape for um, non-invasive prenatal testing is re relatively crowded. There are many companies who are operating in this space using slightly different technologies, as you've already heard, um, but with somewhat overlapping um, goals and methods. There's some tech um, companies that I won't talk about today that are also listed on here that you um, have not heard about, but they're also um, trying to operate in this space. Um, you've already heard about the, some of the major players who are already um, have uh, already released commercially available tests or will be doing so soon, so I'm not going to go over this again. Um, Sequinome, Veronata, Ariosa, and Natera are among the major players. Um, I'm not, I haven't mentioned Fluidine, for example, and the other ones. Um, many of those have not, uh, do not have a, uh, a live commercial test yet or um, in the near future. Um, some of these companies are uh, using very different kinds of technologies than the ones you've heard about. I'm not going to talk about these, but just to say that um, the intellectual property issues will depend on how, which I'm not going to talk in great deal about, but just to let you know that um, the the effect of intellectual property law on how these um, non-invasive tests play out commercially will depend on, in part, on how the claims for the tests um, overlap or do not overlap. And you can see that there's some potential for overlap and non-overlap in um, these different technologies. But you really have to look at the very specifics of the individual patents to determine that um, more specifically. Um, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of patents that have been issued for this technology. I'm only showing you the major IP for the major players in this um, field, but there are many more patents out there that have been um, issued or patent applications. Um, and I'm not going to go over these in great detail, but you can see from the titles um, that they have to do with detection of fetal um, aneuploidy, prenatal diagnosis, and so forth. Um, You'll also recognize some of the names here as inventors. You can see that Steve Quake at Stanford University. Um, Stanford University is the uh, assignee institution on, on one of these major patents, for example. Um, and you can also, also notice that the dates on these um, do vary a lot, but they're relatively recent. So um, one of the major patents was issued um, in the United States. Anyway, the US patent was issued in 2001. Um, the, one of the Veronata patents um, was issued very recently in 2011. 
Um, similarly, one of the patents that went to Ariosa uh, issued in 2010, and there's an application um, from Natera that was um, uh, sent in in 2011. So these are very recent. Okay, so how is this playing out? Um, in December of last year, um, ARIA received a letter from Sequinome requesting a detailed explanation of why the ARIA's test, it was called ARIA at the time, does not infringe their U.S. patent, um, the 540 patent. In December of uh, 2011, there was a complaint filed by ARIA against Sequinome, which asked for a declaration that their test does not infringe and then went further to say that Sequinome has misrepresented its scope um, with the goal of deterring potential competitors from entering the market and deterring doctors and healthcare providers from using anyone um, other than Sequinome. So the shot has been fired across the bow. January 6th of this year, a complaint filed by Natera against Sequinome also asked for a declaration that their paternity test does not infringe on the 540 patent. Also going further saying that one of the 540 claims is invalid. Go on to February of this year. Um, why not pile on? Veronata joins in and Stanford too for good measure. <laughs> Let's just all beat up on Sequinome asking for a declaration that their non-invasive prenatal test does not infringe uh, and Sequinome does infringe on Stanford's patent. Um, also seeking an uh, injunction for patent infringement. So you can see this is the food fight that has ensued in the last few months as all these companies are going live with their commercial testing. So on the one hand, if you're, for example, at the tech transfer office at Stanford or any of the other um, places that have funded this work, um, non-invasive prenatal testing is sort of the, could be a poster child, a good example of technology transfer, right? It's um, university people doing research at their universities funded by the governments of the various companies in which they work um, and private foundations and, and so forth and going to commercial practice very quickly. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the goal of um, technology transfer is to go from basic research to bedside very quickly. Um, and yet you have this food fight situation going on. So, um, so one question is, does that, is that common? Does that happen a lot? Um, in a study that I did um, many years ago, looking at genetic diagnostic patents issued for discoveries funded by the government, we found that 67% of the diagnostic patents, the genetic diagnostic patents um, issued by the U USPTO were government funded. So the majority of them were. Um, Deborah Leonard also did a similar study some years later and found a similar number. So there's a lot of um, discovery going on in the genetic diagnostic space that is um, really being fueled by government funds. Now what about the, um, the threats of patent infringement? Um, in another study that we did, again, many years ago, we found um, when we surveyed all of the directors of clinical genetic labs in the United States, 65% of them said that they had received a notification or a cease and desist letter for, uh, for potential infringement of a patent. So that is also very common. And what was the effect of that on those clinical laboratory directors? Because of the threat then of um, potential patent litigation, a quarter of the labs discontinued providing a clinical genetic test that they were already, um, they had already developed as a laboratory developed test. 53% decided not to conduct further research on um, a genetic test. 67% reported that patents inhibited their research to develop new tests or to improve the quality of existing tests. And 85% indicated that patents inhibited information sharing between laboratories, um, again, to do quality assessment or quality assurance of their lab tests. Um, so you can see that uh, the patents, at least on genetic diagnostic tests, seem to have an inhibitory effect on um, clinical availability. On the other hand, if you talk to people in, um, who develop 
pharmaceuticals and other kinds of products um, in biotechnology. Many of them, um, of course, will tell you that you absolutely need patents to develop um, a product through the very lengthy process that it takes to develop a drug or um, uh, di other kind of diagnostic, um, and at least $100 million. And of course, many will give you estimates that are much higher than this, up to $2 billion to develop a product. Um, but this is the number that was quoted um, most recently, at least in the, uh, the um, lawsuit against Myriad Genetics. So that seems to suggest that um, this whole issue about patents is really um, maybe anomalous for genetic diagnostic tests than for um, other kinds of biotechnology products. And Indeed, when we did a study looking at that for one specific genetic test uh, for hereditary hemochromatosis, um, we found that the mean time from publication, the publication that came out identifying the gene um, for her hereditary hemochromatosis to clinical availability of the tests was 14 months. So that's very quick. Um, and 60% of the labs that were performing the test at the time that we did the survey had begun doing that before the patent came out. So the publication comes out, the patent is filed at about that time, and you can see here on this um, diagram, the green lines are um, where the patent applications are filed. There's a little purple line there when the paper was submitted, then published shortly thereafter. Um, the red line indicates the cumulative number of labs in the United States that start offering the test. The blue lines show um, when the patent's issued. So the labs have already started developing and making this test clinically available before the patents have even issued. And then we did our survey. Then after this, they get cease and desist letters, and that number, the, blue, uh, the red line, goes down after that. Um, so you can see the relationship between patents and incent incenting the research and then coming out with a clinically available test are not the relationship you would think happens. You would think it would happen where, you know, you need the patents first, then you do the research, and then 15 years later you have a product. This is not the situation with genetic diagnostics. So, um, in summary, you can see that the barrier to entry into this space is low. There's a high level of public funding, so patents and um, large amounts of uh, funding from the private sector do not appear to be necessary to uh, create the inventions that are necessary for genetic diagnostics. The time to commercialization is very short. Um, and the regulatory environment is possibly important. So the difference between genetic diagnostic tests and, say, a prescription drug may be in part because of the regulatory hurdles that have to be faced um, in order to get a drug from um, initial discovery to clinical practice, which is very different for prescription drugs um, than for genetic diagnostics or even other kinds of diagnostics. So um, I'll stop there. I'm going to be talking about the patent litigation that Mildred introduced. Um, before I get started, I want to point out, as soon as I figure out how to work this thing, that um, I work part-time at a firm. I'm also a law student. This talk represents my current views, not the views of my firm. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm definitely not your lawyer. Um, <laughs> Uh, I also want to point out that patent law is rather unstable right now, and the litigations I'm going to be discussing themselves are very early stage. So um, this, a lot of this is predictive. It's also simplified, so please bear that in mind. Um, 
Mildred just gave a great introduction to what's going on in these lawsuits. Um, I, I just want to add a couple things. One is that in the Ariosa versus Sequinom case, uh, Sequinom is trying to get a preliminary injunction. Um, and I think everything else is old news at this point. Uh, all of these cases ha are before the same judge in the Northern District of California, Susan Ilston, who's an experienced patent judge. Um, in the Ariosa case, because of the preliminary injunction motion, um, expedited discovery is ongoing. So we'll get news about that case before we get news about uh, the others. The preliminary injunction hearing is June 15th. Uh, the other two cases have not had much happen yet, but they have case management conferences also June 15th. And there's a reasonable possibility that some of the common issues, particularly regarding Sequinom's patent, might be uh, consolidated. So Mildred also mentioned uh, the key patent being asserted by Sequinom, which they've uh, licensed from Isis Innovation Limited. It expires in 2018. Um, the key innovation behind this patent is that it is detection of cell-free fetal DNA in maternal blood, uh, particularly uh, serum or plasma. And um, one of the elements of the, the uh, patent coverage is that it requires amplifying a paternally inherited nucleic acid and then detecting its presence. Um, the patent examiner, while the application was pending at the patent office, stated that the amplifying step is essential. The inventors had originally tried to claim all forms of detection of paternally inherited DNA in the maternal bloodstream. Um, so I think a likely argument in defense is going to be that the patent should be limited somewhat in its, in its interpretation to what the inventors actually invented. And the argument would be that what they actually invented was detection of a unique paternal allele. Not, um, not an amplification technique that amplifies um, in a relatively general way the fetal DNA and lets you analyze that DNA as a whole, including both maternally and paternally inherited material. Um, they don't provide any examples of nonspecific amplification, and it's arguable whether there's any relevant teaching in that area. That'll probably be a battle of the experts eventually. Um, Baranata's patent, which is being asserted only against Sequinom right now, and I'm just going to talk about the, uh, the 018 patent for brevity. Uh, it was filed later. It expires in 2027. Um, and the, the major innovation there was to use massively parallel sequencing in this field. Um, the patent claim requires a chromosome ratio approach, which means comparing the amount of a chromosome um, that is suspected of being aneuploid, so 21 would be the, the most common one, but also 18 or 13, uh, to, a, the, to the level of a chromosome that's presumably euploid, which could be chromosome 1, for example. Um, there, that is a little different from what Sequinom's published trial involved, which was using a predetermined threshold approach. So they took controls in which they knew the, uh, the status, and they compared or they, they generated a threshold range and then just measured the, uh, the test chromosome in their actual samples. So they don't um, calculate a ratio from a test sample between a presumably euploid chromosome and a suspect chromosome. So a likely issue in this litigation or in the, in the, in, uh, for Sequinon defending itself against Baranata's patent is the question of whether their approach is insubstantially or substantially different and this implicates uh, what's known as the doctrine of equivalence, which is a very complex patent law doctrine that has exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions. And so once again, there's going to be a big fight. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention the, uh, the French paper that, that um, Professor Quake referred to earlier. Um, that is a part of the prior art and could be used it to assert, to claim that, that um, Sequinom's patent could be invalid. However, um, the law requires clear and convincing evidence of, of facts that establish patent invalidity. And the paper has some shortcomings, such as that the, um, there's no statement that the, the nucleic acid that was detected was of fetal origin. It was from one individual. There were two technical replicates. It was not statistically significant. And the DNA was in the normal range. Only the total nucleic acid was elevated. So I think that's likely to be an uphill battle. 
to, to try and prove invalidity based on that publication. Um, looking ahead, Sequinom recently acquired um, pending patent applications from a company called Helicos. And what's interesting about that is that Helicos is uh, a company that, developed, that has developed um, single molecule sequencing. So it's amplification independent. Um, if you remember, Sequinom's patent, one of the key features of it was that this, this amplification requirement. So their, um, their pending patent applications that they've uh, obtained the rights to could be very complementary because they could provide um, amplification independent coverage. Now these are still pending, so we don't know what their scope is going to be and actually the, what the scope of a patent is going to be even after it issued is somewhat uncertain until it's actually litigated. Another possibility under, in the scenario in which um, enforcement is successful is extraterritorial competition. Um, U.S. method patents, which all of these are, cannot be enforced against foreign activity unless a product is imported back into the United States. Um, simple information, so the, the fact of what happened in a test, is not generally considered a product, particularly if it could be carried back into the country inside someone's head. Um, So, in conclusion, the litigants are likely to vigorously contest, contest the exact scope of these patents. Uh, Sequinom appears to be pursuing potentially very complementary IP, and um, successful enforcement could result in offshoring. I'm not commenting on the regulatory issues that may result from performing some of these things outside the country. Uh, just from a patent law perspective, it looks like that would be a possibility. Good morning. Um, let me get this. Yeah, I'm not used to that. Um, good morning. I, uh, I didn't put it on this slide. Usually I put it on this slide. I, I am from the FDA. That should tell you just about everything you need to know. I look at life with a rose colored glasses. All the companies think that they're black and they're, I can't see out of them. Um, I am going to give a little bit of a gloom and doom talk, unfortunately. Uh, I am not usually a gloom and doom person, but but uh, uh, you will see that I believe this to be an area, well, this, we're, we're in, at a time in which uh, a lot of deregulatory action is taking, uh, taking part in laboratory science, and um, this, this area particularly is one uh, that is going to, that is, has the potential of creating a, somewhat of a mess, um, and, and almost did in a couple of times. So, I will, I will tell you about what the regulatory landscape is and, and, and where we are. So uh, I'll do a, just a regulatory, a, a summary of the regulatory paradigm, talk about laboratory developed tests, which is mostly the tests that are being offered now are laboratory developed tests and, and what the current status is. So just this slide, I, I don't really want to go through all the laws uh, uh, that, that, uh, that really affect this area, but I, just to tell you that that uh, the FDA really has started in 1908, that each one of these laws, as you see there, were the result of a disaster of one type or another. Uh, the, the Food Act of 1908 is, is what began the FDA. In 1938, we began regulating devices among the drugs because somebody trying to do the right thing. They weren't trying to do the wrong thing. They took actually a, a, um, a drug that was for adults. They were trying to get it for kids, and they dissolved it into glycerin and caused some deaths. So, and the 1938 Act was also, and, and the 1966 Act is when the FDA began doing drugs, at least the pre-market part, and that was also the, the thalamidite, thalamidite disaster in Europe. Um, and the, even the CLIA 1988 law, this is the, the Clinical Laboratory uh, Improvement Act, was as a result of 
problems with pap smears, disasters with pap smears. So um, we don't tend to be a, a, a society that likes regulation, but we tend to react when disasters occur. I want to start with the 1976 amendments because that's when actually devices began to be regulated. It provided a definition for a medical device, defined the standard to be used, and provided a regulatory paradigm. This is very different from what most people are used to the FDA being, which is the drug type of, of regulation. Our, our paradigm is actually quite different. Um, just a de definition is, is really, really broad, and I only put it out there because it states uh, machine contrivance in vitro reagents, so we actually, uh, the, the definition of, of what a medical device is extremely broad. It, nowhere in there does it say uh, that it depends on where the device is being produced. That is, it doesn't say exception, laboratories that develop their own tests are not regulated by this law. So our reading of the law is that laboratory developed tests are actually under FDA regulation. It sets a standard that is that, that uh, we, we look for safety and effectiveness, but that standard is actually somewhat uh, risk-based. We have three, three risks, uh, a, a common low risk devices. These are about 50% of the devices and things like, oh, um, uh, thermometers are class one devices. Uh, class two are more complex type of devices. Most of the in vitro diagnostic tests fall under class two. And the standard there is actually what we call substantial equivalence. That is, the test has to be equivalent to something that was in the market in 1976. Not a particularly high standard. Um, for, for very complex and for devices that actually, uh, that, that we, we consider high risk, the standard is showing that it's safe and effective. All of devices require general control. General controls are things like they have to register with the FDA and list. They have to follow good manufacturing practices, and good manufacturing practices are set by the manufacturer. And this comes actually way back from the aviation industry, a lot of this. This is what do you need to do to control your device? What do you need to do to make sure that it's designed appropriately for where you're going to be using it? And what controls do you have to have in your suppliers so that you get what you think you're going to get? These are actually very important. Um, you have to report device failures to the FDA. You have to remedy if there's a problem. You have to do something about it. And you have labeling requirements, which actually are fairly important because we consider labeling everything, even advertisement. So your intended use, the way you advertise it, is part of your labeling. For those things in, in class two, uh, there are class two moderate risks, which are a lot of the vitro diagnostics. We do have things like design controls. You have to be able to design the device to what, you, what, what you're going to decide, what it's going to do, and you have to test it to those designs. You have to have performance data, you have to have tracking requirements, and you have to do post-market surveillance. All these are important things to make sure that the device is functioning the way you think it is functioning. Now, the pre-market program, as I say, is divided into two. Uh, the, the class two, we do uh, substantial, uh, substantial equivalence, and pre-market approval, we do look at, at things that are safe and effective. There are some administrative differences, but in many ways, what we look at, is, at least for in vitro diagnostics, is actually quite similar. And we look at analytical performance, that is accuracy, precision, analytical sensitivity, analytical specificity that this is at least in what has been published, although not quite all of it, we, we actually would, would require a lot more than has been published. Uh, this is probably where it, uh, the prenatal tests that, are, that were talked about this morning are, um, they're in this realm. We also look at clinical performance. That is clinical validity in the slide that was shown previously. We do require clinical validity. That is, is the signal that you're detecting can it, does it have a clinical mean, meaning to it? Is there a clinical action that can be taken uh, from it? Uh, and we look at clinical sensitivity, specificity, and I didn't put it here, but it's really important is that more, a lot of the times we, especially with screening tests, we publish both positive predictive and negative predictive values because that is what people are going to be able to use. At, at determining what those positive predictive and negative predictive values are extremely important so that people have an understanding of how the test performs in the population that is going to be used. Now, FDA review is not outcome-oriented. Um, that is, it's not clinical utility. 
um, is usually concurrent, but it's not, but, you know, so a few times is a prospective studies. A lot of times the retrospective studies are, depends a little bit on what you're doing. Uh, we do try to be least burdensome. That is in our law. That is, we don't require more than is necessary to show that the device works. But it's really based on just good science, being able to look at the data, being able to determine whether the, the test actually does what it does. And we rely a lot on labeling, that is, truthful labeling. We put everything on the labeling so that the user understands where the te how the test works, where it works, where it doesn't work. In 1976, when the law passed and the, the agency went through and did all the regulations for the different tests, um, there were some laboratory developed tests. They were mostly local, they were mostly non-commercial, test methods were generally well established and accessible. There was usually a clinical pathologist patient relationship. Usually these tests were performed at, in, in hospitals or, or in academic centers. There, there were really very simple software, if at all, or calculations. Uh, tests usually for diagnosis or monitoring, often for rare disease or unmet needs, performed by specialists with advanced training and require expert interpretation, and there were small test volumes. So the agency decided in 1976 or thereabouts, and this is a little bit uh, made up history, uh, because we actually don't have uh, the, you know, it, it's, we think what, this is what happened, but it, you know, it's one of the problems with, with, so with enforcement discretion is that it's, it, it was a policy that is not well defined, um, but essentially what we think happened is that, that, uh, that the agency decided that there were enough controls and there was enough expertise in those laboratories that they, they, the agency did not need to regulate them, at least not actively regulate them. Um, now, there are many re reasons for this practice, but it doesn't mean that the agency actually does not have the ability to regulate laboratory developed tests, but it chose not to. Unfortunately, part of the uh, not well de uh, developed or written policy is that the definition of what a laboratory developed test is never was put down. So, um, so now we'll come to the present and what are LDTs now? Many are for the same. They're, it, they're actually based in the same uh, laboratories that are attached to hospitals. Um, still often for needs or rare diseases, still need the expertise interpretation. But now there are, t there are many that are very, very different beasts. The volumes of types of LDT has grown. Often mechanism for, to, for market entry of novel tests, particularly so in this area, all the, except one of the companies that was here this afternoon, all ha are, are, they call themselves diagnostic companies. All of them are actually CLIA laboratories. Uh, they advertise themselves as diagnostic companies. They really, some of them are actually uh, uh, developing their own, their own instruments that they hope to sell. Um, uh, really more of a, of a, of a diagnostic company than a, than a, a CLIA laboratory, but they all, uh, uh, they all, um, uh, give the test out in, as, as a clear laboratory. Uh, there's a higher proportion of commercial labs and biotech companies, often no clinical pathologist patient relationship to speak of. The tests are developed for broad commercial use. They are advertised broadly, aggressively marketed. I don't know if you saw, but, but last year, uh, Sikonom took a loss and most of the loss came from the growth of its, of its uh, selling sales uh, um, uh, force that increased a lot so they could go out and sell the, the tests. Um, direct to consumer advertising, intense sales, overnight shipping, nationwide, nationwide and international reach, often require complex software. Many incorporate automated interpretations. Tests increasingly empirical, non-transparent, rely on compl complex statistical methods. Clinical validity not well understood, uh, I, I think it was actually pointed out that the, the, all they do is they, they give the clinical, uh, the analytical um, uh, results and they let the, the doctors or patients use it as they wish. Um, more tests uh, for predictive drug response and risk disease and novel tests often developed by companies and licensed to a lab. So what has been the result of enforcement discretion? 
is enforcement discretion has become a loophole. Many LDTs are now dependent on components assembled and marketed by others. We, we, so we actually heard about a microchip being used. The microchip was likely sold to the, is so likely sold to the laboratory as a research use only device. That is that the, the person that is putting together the microchip get, ha, is, is, has no responsibility at all on how the microchip is being used. That is as if you, if you went to an airline and you get on a plane and find out that the plane, the plane was sold to the company uh, only for, not, not for commercial use. I'm not sure you would get on that plane. Um, you know, so the laboratory itself doesn't have a contract with the manufacturer to make sure that if there are any changes that they, the laboratory knows. There are no controls essentially on, on, their, uh, on their raw materials. Um, many LDTs now depend on components assembled and marketed by others and as usually as research use only. Business models leverage and force discretion for rapid market access to avoid FDA oversight. And now there is really a parallel industry uh, with traditional IVDs. Now, you might say, well, this is a regular speaking. His job depends on doing this. Um, but it hasn't been just the FDA saying that there's a problem here. Um, really, in, in the mid-90s, that was more than 20 years ago, uh, there was an IOM report uh, stating the problems, the lack of regulation in laboratory developed tests. Uh, there was an NIH uh, uh, task force on genetic tests that also stated the problems. And then there was a secretary, um, a, a, that is the secretary for the Department of Health and Human Services, a secretary committee on genetic testing in 2000 re, uh, reported to the secretary that the FDA should begin to regulate laboratory developed tests. This was under a democratic uh, administration. Obviously, that was not something that, the, that a Republican administration was coming in and wanted to hear. So they disbanded that. that committee that formed the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Genetic Health and Society that in 2007 again said the FDA should begin to regulate laboratory developed tests. So um, lately, as of this year, um, because of a, a case in Duke University in which uh, a, uh, a, a device that was fraudulent was using clinical trials, the IOM uh, about a month ago, again in a, in a report on, on genomics stated that the FDA needs to begin to regulate laboratory developed tests. The FDA two years ago said that it was going to put a proposal on the table um, and we have uh, not yet put the proposal on the table. Um, not, not my doing. Um, it's, it's under administrative review. So what do we have now? We have two paths to, to market. One, uh, the commercial distributed path, that is the, the manufacturers come through the FDA, and a laboratory developed uh, pathway. By the way, many of the, many, if not all by now, of the manufacturers, well-known manufacturers, Roche, Abbott, all of them have their own clear laboratory in which they now, uh, they, 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 they put out uh, tests that are not ready for prime time uh, as a way to get to the, to the prime time. Beckman Coulter, the last one, just bought a clear lab. So, they will be also doing the same. So what, let, let's talk about what it means for patients and, and what, what are the issues here. Well, I think there is definitely a, an issue, first of all, in the research phase. Uh, there is an issue in the research phase because the, the law and FDA has very strict laws as to when do you, when do you bring a test or when do you bring a device uh, into investigational use? What is investigational use? What needs to be done to protect patients? What do the IRVs have to do? We, we inspect the IRVs. We require uh, submissions for those, th those tests, for example, in which uh, therapies would be, would be administered. Or in certain cases, we would require them to come to the agency and to clear for that. We require them to collect data. And we require them to tell patients exactly what is, what is known and what isn't known about the test that they're having done. Um, CLIA, uh, so the, the, the it's CLIA, it's CLIA is administered by CMS. Uh, the way CLIA is administered, CLIA only really regulates the laboratories. It regulates the laboratory procedures. It makes sure that the laboratory has uh, appropriate expertise. And in, when it goes and inspects them, it makes sure that the reagents are not outdated. It makes sure that uh, there is a 
book that says for a specific test that says that the, uh, that the um, laboratory has done uh, uh, analytical validity, although uh, the, the inspectors that go don't have the expertise to sit down and go through that data to understand whether that, the, that uh, analytical validity was done well or not. Um, but essentially, uh, CLIA just makes sure that a test that, that is, it has gone out, and it has gone out because CLIA usually inspects within a year or so and they inspects that test, um, that, that the test, uh, there's been some work done on the test. Um, so there is no research phase or no investigational phase, really, for tests that are laboratory developed tests, uh, unlike for other tests. And that is the problem that we saw with the Duke University uh, test, that, that it was an investigational use test that should have come through the agency, and hopefully we would, we would have seen that it was not validated properly before, before patients were, were actually um, uh, treated with drugs based on the test itself. Um, the analytical validity that is done by CLIA, again, is, is, is really post hoc and is only cursory. Uh, the FDA actually looks at the data and, and determines whether you actually have validated your, your test analytically correctly or not. And there is no clinical validity need, needed for a laboratory developed test through CLIA. That is, you can just have some analytical validity and provide the test, again, as, as was stated this morning, for people to use as they wish. Um, there is no requirement for CLIA for the laboratories to report adverse events. There is no way to follow if there's a problem. Uh, I don't know if you saw last year or so, Quest had a problem in that it had been uh, providing vitamin, wrong vitamin D results uh, for about two years. Um, there is no way to follow up. If, if the research use instrument, uh, if there's a problem with that, there is no, the, 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 uh, it, there's no way for uh, the agency to find out to make the instrument producer recall instruments, and we do do that because there are lots of reasons that things happen, even to the best even to people like Toyota, who have the best quality in, 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 in an industry, sometimes things go wrong. And when quality disappears, uh, somebody needs to make sure that the right thing is done. And it is not transparent. Uh, I think as we saw this morning, uh, the companies uh, clearly want to tell you that they have a great test, 99% uh, you know, sensitive, and, well, it's analytical validity only, so it, it, you know, the accuracy if you like. Um, but what they don't tell you is that actually they haven't, they haven't done an analysis at all on pre-analytical um, uh, and post-analytical rates of errors, which are actually tend to be the biggest part in, in biggest problems sometimes for laboratories. That is, the, the number of errors they commit in either getting the sample, not, not storing the sample properly, mixing samples, mixing results towards the end, all those things actually, there was a, a, run, a RAND um, a study in the mid 2000, 2005 or so that, that showed that actually a, a frightening number of, of erroneous results occur um, if you look at the whole process. Um, clearly, all you see is that they're extremely accurate. You actually don't even see what the, the sensitivity or specificity in, of those tests are in the population that is being used and much less what their predictive values are. So what are the risks of, of insufficient oversight? Uh, well, it really is incorrect diagnosis or treatment. And I would advise you that for a set of tests that are going to be more and more likely used for people early on and to make determinations uh, without really understanding what are the, the risks or what are the, the, the false error, false positive and negative errors of the test, um, in some ways I think we, we, we are in, a, in an era of problems. Um, FDA has observed the following re in recent years. Poor clinical validity, faulty data analysis, a gender, uh, exaggerated claim, fraudulent, fraudulent data. And did I need to remind you the sequenome itself almost uh, almost started the test out when they actually found out that the data they originally had was fraudulent. Um, no post-market surveillance at all. 
and use investigation of state, stage devices without informed consent. All those are problems. Now, I'm not saying that regulation by the FDA is the panacea. I'm not saying that it actually will set us in the correct, uh, in the correct direction, actually. If you look at the FDA has been regulating um, a PSA tests now since you know, the mid-90s. And yet, uh, clearly, because we didn't do our homework and we didn't really think about what screening was, what, what, you know, how many people are being uh, actually correctly uh, diagnosed and how many people are being treated uh, with potential risk in the treatment, um, clearly uh, we, we have done that, uh, especially in screening, we, we tend to take tests out. And it's actually very, very difficult once it's being used in this way, as it was pointed out, once it's made available, people don't want to go through a, a lengthy uh, uh, trial that actually will help us determine whether the, the test makes sense or not. It just becomes the practice of medicine. And we've seen that in PSA. We've seen that actually in, in breast uh, x-ray screening and, and, and the new data are coming out. So I'm going to leave you with that. I do think... Uh, that this is an area that could potentially, I do want to say, because laboratory developed tests are not uh, well defined, um, we don't consider, for example, a test that is, that is uh, uh, built on pieces that, are not, that somebody else provides as a laboratory developed test. Um, so the, the agency does have some, some uh, ability to move in this area when we see things that are out of whack. And, um, we do hope that at some point uh, we don't wait for a disaster to determine that something needs to be done to plug the regulatory holes, but that we can actually move towards a, uh, a better regulation in this area uh, that makes sense uh, in, a, in a way that makes sense so that it doesn't, it doesn't reduce innovation, but it does let people know what, what, you know, how ready for prime time Test are part of the problem here is that if you have an investigational use only test, the payers are not going to pay for it. In some ways, though, that is what we have now in this area is an investigational use test. Um, and I do think that patients should actually know uh, what is the, the um, not only the patients, but those, uh, those uh, the people that are helping the patients understand what decisions to make. They should know. What, what is the state of the science and what actually do we know and what we don't know. Thank you. We have some time for questions. We have some questions for the time. She's coming up. I would note, I said earlier that Stanford Law students are among the smartest people in the world. I'm glad that Adam didn't disprove my... <laughs> Hi, thanks guys. Uh, this question is um, for you. Um, I'm sorry, Alberto, what is your last name? I get, uh, Guterres. Guterres, I didn't want to mispronounce it. <laughs> um, so uh, you had mentioned that the FDA um, may be submitting at some point a proposal to increase the regulation or um, and w what do you think the timing for that would be is the first part of the question. And then the second part would be, would it actually apply to some of these tests that are being developed now or would those sort of be grandfathered in so that they would kind of fly under the radar in terms of FDA regulation? So we have we actually held a public meeting uh, to announce that we were coming coming out with something and have pretty much given a fairly fairly detailed uh, um, description of what we're going to be putting on the table, including that we would obviously begin with things that we would consider high risk, um, and we would uh, um, uh, how do we determine that you know it's easiest for those tests that are that are um, already approved and on the market. So for example, I'll give you an, uh, an easy one. HPV testing, there are now four FDA approved HPV tests with some actually with very, very good data. These are screening tests. Yet we still have um, uh, laboratory developed tests that are, that are out there that are, are offering HPV testing. So those would be easy, they would have to come in. There are others like in this area where uh, determination of what the risk is 
um, um, would, would have to occur, um, uh, although we do think that the, the prenatal screening is, in, in most cases, we would consider, uh, consider it a, a, a class three device. Um, and, and, um, and we would give, obviously, the companies time to be able to put their, their submissions together and we would also, we don't want everything to come in at the same time to the FDA because there's now quite a bit out there. So that would take some time, period of time, and then we have plans as to later on how do we bring in the rest of the test. But the, the, the hope would be to do this in a, in, in a smart way. Um, we, um, I don't want to get myself in trouble. I, I, you know, uh, I guess what, what I can say is this is under administrative review. And if you read the New York Times editorial uh, last Sunday in which they talk about uh, uh, this administration and regulation and its track record versus like the Bush, you understand that, that this is administration uh, has moved slowly when, when regulation is in, in the offing. We have not been able to hear you well. Um, assume that someone has a technique, a non-invasive technique, let's say saliva, um, or a product that looks very good. It has a proclivity for testing, for indicating a possibility of cancer, not only Down syndrome, Parkinson's, blindness, deafness. And it has been tested, but insufficiently for the FDA. You know that the group has no further funds Will you do anything, even in an extreme case, that would be so helpful to the public of helping them find further funds? So uh, funding is not typically um, our purview, although we do work with, with uh, some of the funding agencies to, to, uh, to help in those cases that we have identified. Um, we, we, are usually typically involved early on if the companies want us to be involved um, in, in both helping them, uh, uh, because a, a lot of the tests that are coming down the market require uh, new regulatory insights from us, require us to do things in different ways. So for example, multiplexing has been quite challenging for us. It's, it's very different from the way we regulated previously. Um, and so we, we do tend to be involved. But in many ways, you know, it, it requires the companies themselves to bring us in. Not, we, we don't tend to be more unless we're asked. How far would you go? What is the most that you know in terms of either finding other individual funds or? So we, we have help. I mean, I can, I, can, I can speak about a specific case. So for example, for, for the, uh, the artificial pancreas is, is actually also under my purview. We have worked with, with the, with the um, uh, JDRF, the uh, ju uh, Juvenile um, um, Diabetes um, Group, to actually fund some of the studies that need to be done. We, you know, we, when we can, we have done that, but money doesn't usually, we don't have ourselves money in which we do all that. Um, we do work with the NIH, uh, which is usually the one that funds this type of research uh, and, and, and help them uh, design the appropriate uh, trials and so for, for tests, but, but it's usually they are the ones that fund it. And depending on the disease, there may be possibilities for orphan device designations that can help with funding. So think about the orphan device system, which is very parallel to the orphan drug system, or similar to the orphan drug system. Right. It, it, um, typically, though, for, for in vitro diagnostics, we don't have a lot of orphans. And the reason for that is that we tend to slide more towards analytical validity or even analytical validity with, with specimens that have been, that have been uh, doctored in one way or another because we can't get a lot of specimens, so we do with the best we can. And you, typically, we slide those in under 510Ks, which the bar is not very high anyway. So it, it's usually a, a, an easier way for, get, for us to get those into the market. So the orphan designation wouldn't be that helpful because it's easier under the 510K anyway. That's right. Look at CF. We actually have now seven CFs tests, and some of them have mutations for which we have down to you know, a couple of samples only. Uh, and we actually have cleared those. 
Mr. Gutierrez, I have a question. I think two years ago, the FDA had issued a public warning letter to Sequinom. I haven't seen any other public letters for the other companies. So I was wondering just what was the thought process for targeting one company but not the others? So Sequinom was early. Um, and about the time that we issued the, the, the letter to Sequinom, um, we put, we actually stated publicly that we were going to be uh, putting a proposal on the table. Once we did that, it became more difficult to do anything, even for those, uh, uh, those laboratory-developed tests that we actually don't believe are laboratory-developed tests because it, just, it doesn't look very good when you're actually supposedly putting something on the table and then going out and taking action against, uh, against companies. So it, it, in itself, the fact that we, we stated that we were going to be uh, putting, you know, putting a proposal um, has made it more difficult for us to move against those companies that we believe are outside the realm of what we think is a laboratory developed test. I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I was wondering if you could outline for us some of the challenges that you think are potentially unique to these kinds of prenatal genetic testing and things that you might want to include as part of a proposal that have made it um, more challenging to get a proposal on the table for some of these tests? I'm not sure that there is anything unique except other than in this case there, there's probably this this is an area where you you're going to have um, politically it is probably not as as it, it, it's it, there are a lot of issues on the table here <laughs> and so so this is the case where if there is a problem uh, even those people who think that regulators are bad are likely to jump in the regulator bandwagon if there is a problem. So, um, you know, th this one is one that crosses kind of the political lines in some ways, in some odd ways. And I don't know if, if I mean, I, I think that in itself is, makes it a... So would you say the political issues that surround some of the prenatal genetic testing is actually holding up regulation in some respects? No, I don't think I would say that. I think that the LDT testing, uh, per se, which is we are really focused on the more, we, you know, when we started trying to, to deal with the laboratory developed test, we actually decided at one point to try to narrow it to those tests that we would consider uh, um, class three or, or high risk. Um, and therefore, we actually wrote, so did some warning letters to, to places like LabCorp for a test uh, on ovarian cancer. Uh, which actually had this, some of the, the very same problems that this test had. They, they, they developed this test that was actually fairly um, sensitive and specific, supposedly around 97, 95, um, and they began offering a screening, and it was becoming clear that, you know, um, probably about 14 out of 15 women that were being uh, told that they had ovarian cancer did not have ovarian cancer, and so the women were having their ovaries removed and 14 out of 15, obviously, is not a good number. Um, we decided to take action, and we actually wrote a warning letter, and LabCorp decided not to continue with that test. Um, but that was when we were, we, we were put actually some guidances and, and were trying to cover up pieces that we thought were pieces that we could go after. When the administration changed, we thought we could actually put together a reasonable proposal that would make sense by which we would regulate by risk like we regulate now. It would make sense to move forward with that proposal in, and, and that is essentially what happened in, in, and that's why we are now. Um, if this area had been around when we were actually trying to carve out the different sections, I would not have been surprised that this would have been an area that we would have considered um, uh, having a, a stronger pres presence. Did I, I, somehow I wasn't quite following, but the cystic fibrosis, you said that there's many testing panels that have all been approved. Yeah, been cleared by the FDA, yes. Cleared by the FDA. Yeah. So it brings up this interesting, from a genetic counselor's perspective, looking at genotype, phenotype, correlation is so difficult. So with genetic testing, it becomes really complicated to really interpret the value of information and where, like you say, a couple a couple of tests that have been approved by the FDA that have mutations that have only been seen in a couple of individuals, 
Um, I, don't, I wonder if that is, can be misleading to the public that because it's been FDA approved. I don't know if I'm making sense, but. I, 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 it's something we worry about. Uh, one of the good things, though, is typically we, we put everything on the website. We put our review, and, and the label becomes quite extensive. So we, we provide uh, uh, very good information for uh, clinicians that are using the test. Um, it is, though, but, but I, I, to the public, though, I think this is an area that they haven't focused because it's extremely complex and difficult to understand. They don't understand between the difference between a clear laboratory-developed test versus an FDA clear or approved. They don't understand the difference between a, a clear test and, and, and a bar that, that a clear test has versus a, an approved test that actually where we looked at the, at the safety and effectiveness. So, so I think and the public is mostly confused. They, they, they think that a lot of the tests that are being performed have been looked, by the, uh, looked at by the agency. And, and if, they, if they are told that they haven't, they don't understand necessarily what the difference is. Yeah, thank you. Another question for you. Uh, to what extent is the approach of the FDA to prenatal diagnostic testing different than uh, its approach to genetic testing aimed at adults, so personal genomics companies? I wouldn't call it uh, different per se. I, I think, you know, again, what we look, what we do when we look at a test is how is it going to be used, and the risk is based on what are the results of a negative, a false negative, or a false positive results. What are the clinical consequences of that? And that's what, what, we, uh, what we look at. One of the funny things here in screening, and screening overall in prenatal screening is, is, is less regulated than screening in most areas. I mean, we have a, a, a mammography regulation that actually the FDA regulates mammography, uh, the, the facilities themselves. It's the only facility regulation we have. Uh, and uh, uh, CLIA clearly was, came up um, because of PAP screening and, and regulating uh, the screening to us. The, the prenatal screening older than uh, have actually been largely not regulated by anybody. The quad screen, the, there are just more the practice of medicine, um, and, and that in itself, uh, it's a little bit different from other screening tests that, that the agency has done. I'm a little surprised that no one has asked a question about the incredibly clear and straightforward details of the patent situation. <laughs> but I'll do that. Uh, I think mainly aimed at Adam. Two questions, Adam. So there's a June 15th preliminary injunction hearing in Ariosa versus Sequinom. Um, what are we likely to learn from, what are, is it possible that we, we, we will learn from that and how soon after June 15th most likely would we learn something? Well, the standard for a preliminary injunction in a patent case is high. Um, their sequinom needs to establish that their patent is not likely to be proven invalid, is likely to cover Ariosa's technique that the balance of hardships favors sequinom so that the ongoing infringement is more harmful to sequinom than being shut down is harmful to uh, Ariosa, and that it's in the public interest to order Ariosa off the market. So that the public interest factors are access to this test on the one hand versus the sort of generalized public interest in enforceable patents, which is supposedly you know, the notion that patents are good things. Um, Despite what Mildred says. Right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there, there's any number of ways that the motion could fail. Um, the, the decision will be in writing. Uh, we'll get an explanation. Um, the judge will consider these factors and weigh them. It is possible for a strong showing on some of the factors to outweigh um, one or maybe two of them. But um, so I take it you think it would be a really good day for Sequinom if they get the preliminary injunction. Yes. And how long, roughly, do we usually wait between hearings and results in cases like this? It the so preliminary injunctions are extraordinary relief. They're supposed to be decided quickly. On the other hand, this is complicated. Right. A um, so couple of months. I would be. I think yeah, something like that. 
Second question for you, to, sorry folks, to delve even deeper into the details of patent law. Does Prometheus have potentially anything to do with any of these patents? Prometheus is a Supreme Court decision that has confused almost everybody. I, I think um, it would take an extension of Prometheus for it to affect the 540 patent sequinoms um, because sequinoms, the, cl the claim does literally involve a process, the amplification step I talked about. Um, the, the claim in the Prometheus case itself was kind of doing measuring something somehow and thinking about it is the really uncharitable way of describing that claim. And here at least they said there's an amplification which is a chemical reaction. It's more specific so you'd have to extend Prometheus and the Supreme Court might be willing to do that. I doubt a district court judge is. Or the CFAC? Probably not. So to go back to the earlier question for a second and then I'll, I'll like what you know. Um, the preliminary injunction hearing is just on the issue of Ariosa's potential infringement of Sequinom's patent. In terms of the power of Veronata's patent, we won't know that presumably for quite some time. That's right. They, they haven't really even gotten into this discovery yet. They haven't filed invalidity or infringement contentions, so it's going to be, yes. And, wow. and if the preliminary injunction is not granted at Sequinom's request, how long would it, ballpark, rough guess, I understand this is an unfair question, but I'm a law professor and you're a law student, so I can do that. <laughs> um, how long likely before we had an answer if the preliminary injunction isn't granted? Probably a year or two, unless the preliminary injunction goes really badly, in which case you can, you can maybe read the all there. But if the opinion says that there's no, that there's there's no chance in hell of, yeah. Yeah, yeah that could happen theoretically. More likely, it's that it's unclear. Mildred, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Well, I just had a question um, for for Adam um, about this. What kinds of um, information would might be included in this sort of consideration of the impact on the public in you know in the, uh, injunction? Because I'm just wondering if they will get into details like cost accessibility. Um, the way the reports come out, the things that um, we talked about in that in that panel from the clinician's point of view or um, from the patient's point of view, are they going to really get into those kind of details when they're thinking about the impact of a possible uh, The judge has a lot of discretion in terms of what can be considered in, in weighing the public interest factor. Um, I, I do know that there have been cases where public health considerations weighed against an injunction. Um, and you know, the, it's, it's a case specific inquiry. There's no you know, rule that you cannot consider one thing and you must consider something else in this area. I think cost, if, if it's just a question of cost and the products are identical, it's, that's, that's probably not a winning argument. But if there are, you know, if, to the extent that Ariosa can establish that their product does things that Sequinom doesn't, that um, would be a powerful argument, I would think. 